did that. Yeah, I'm curious. That's great. Ah, uh, I was just about to tweet at you. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the April 2018 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please introduce our agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. For today's meeting, you will hear six items for your consideration. First, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking to ensure that universal service support is not used to purchase equipment or services from companies posing a national security threat to the integrity of communications networks or the communications supply chain. Second, you will consider a public notice that would seek comment on the procedures for the auctions of upper microwave flexible use service licenses in the 28 gigahertz and 24 gigahertz bands. Third, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes a new alternative application process designed for a class of satellites referred to as small satellites. Fourth, you will consider a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that will adopt new measures and seek comment on others to better tackle the problem of call completion and ensure that telephone calls are completed to all Americans, including those in rural America. Fifth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking proposing to enable model-based rate of return carriers to elect incentive regulation for their lower speed business data services offerings and seeking comment on removing ex ante pricing regulation for packet based and higher speed circuit based offerings. Six, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking proposing to eliminate the requirement that cable operators maintain a channel lineup at their local office and seeking comment on eliminating the requirement that certain cable operators make their channel lineup available via their online public inspection file. This is your agenda for today. Please note the Media Bureau item entitled Amendment of Section 73.624G of the Commission's Rules Regarding Submission of FCC Form 2100, Schedule G, Used to Report TV Stations Ancillary or Supplementary Services and Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative, previously listed in the Commission's April 10th Sunshine Notice, has been adopted by the Commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item today, entitled Protecting Against National Security Threats to Communications Supply Chain Through FCC Programs, will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Before I turn the floor over to Chief Monteith, I do want to apologize to the American public. I know there is huge interest in our work to amend Section 73.624G of the Commission's rule regarding submission of Form 2100 Schedule G. Unfortunately, you'll just have to read about it. You won't be able to see it. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, the Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a notice of proposed rulemaking aimed at protecting against national security threats to the communications supply chain through FCC programs. The notice proposes a rule that, if adopted, would ensure that money in the Universal Service Fund is not used in a way that undermines our national security. I would like to thank the teams in the Competition Policy and Telecommunications Access Policy Divisions for their excellent work on this proceeding. We also received invaluable input from our colleagues in the enforcement, international, public safety and homeland security, and wireless telecommunications bureaus, as well as from the offices of communications business opportunities, general counsel, legislative affairs, managing director, and strategic planning. Seated at the table with me from the Wireline Competition Bureau are Madeline Finley, Deputy Bureau Chief, Brian Palmer, Division Chief, Telecommunications Access Policy Division, Dan Kahn, Division Chief, Competition Policy Division, Aaron Garza, Special Counsel, TAP-D, Ramesh Nagarajan, Attorney Advisor, CPD, and John Vesklosky, Attorney Advisor, CPT. Ramesh will now present the item. Thank you. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Threats to the security of our nation's communications networks posed by certain communications equipment providers have long been a matter of concern in the executive branch and in Congress. As the supply chain for these networks increasingly reaches far beyond U.S. borders, the need to address these threats has become more pressing. Although the FCC does not have the authority or capacity to solve this problem alone, the, this notice of personal rulemaking recognizes the Commission does have a role to play. The notice, if adopted, would propose and seek comment on a targeted rule to ensure that USF funding is not spent on equipment or services from suppliers that raise national security concerns. Specifically, it would propose and seek comment on a rule that going forward, no universal service support may be used to purchase or obtain any equipment or services produced or provided by any company posing a national security threat to the integrity of communications networks or the communications supply chain. The notice would seek comment on this proposal generally and on any potential alternatives. The notice would also seek comment on how best to implement the proposal, including the types of services and equipment that should be covered by the proposed rule, how the FCC should identify which suppliers are covered by the proposed rule, and the expected costs and benefits of the proposed rule. Additionally, the notice would seek comment on how USF recipients can learn which suppliers fall within the scope of the proposed rule, and whether there are other compliances, compliance issues that the Commission should consider, especially for smaller USF recipients. The actions proposed in this item are in keeping with the Commission's obligation to be a responsible steward of the public funds used in the, U in the USF programs and its intended obligations to ensure that money in the Universal Service Fund is not used in a way that undermines a, or poses a threat to our national security. The Bureau recommends adoption of this notice of proposed rulemaking and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagarajan. We'll now turn to uh, comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Just like transport, energy, and water, communications networks are an integral part of our daily lives. These networks are now, in most quarters, considered critical infrastructure, which is why protecting them from national security threats is such a top priority. Communications networks not only support a wide variety of services that underpin the social and economic dynamics of our country, next generation networks such as 5G and the Internet of Things promise to red rapidly transform industries such as healthcare, education, public safety, transportation, and manufacturing. While we must take the responsibility of securing this critical infrastructure seriously, we have the added challenge of doing so in a way that is cost effective. Getting it wrong will not only do little to safeguard national security, but hamper our efforts to close the digital divide and not serve the public interest. Our dual responsibilities enshrined in, enshrined in statute are clear to protect both the integrity of our nation's communications networks and ensure that all Americans have access to communication services. But we can ill afford to slow down the progress of innovation and investment when it comes to these communications networks, nor raise the cost of deployment or adoption of services for those who need connectivity the most. In this notice of proposed rulemaking, we seek comment on whether we should prohibit universal service funds from being used to purchase any equipment or services by any company posing national security threats to, to the integrity of communications networks. In being good stewards, we must carefully assess all costs and benefits of any proposed approach and evaluate all viable alternatives to determine the best next step. We must minimize national security threats while, avoid, while avoiding putting undue burdens on small and rural communication service providers and those living in high-cost areas where connectivity is either lacking or needs improvement. More pointedly, we must consider whether this proposal could ultimately increase equipment or service costs for consumers and providers benefiting from USF funds. As we identify and eliminate possible security vulnerabilities, we need the participation of stakeholders so that we may strike the proper marketplace balance. Quantitative and qualitative data would be especially helpful to demonstrate the potential impact of any proposal on national security and the goals of USF to include network deployment and services, 
offered by small and rural businesses that receive universal service fund support. I would like to thank my colleagues for agreeing to my request to seek additional comment on these issues and on the cost and benefits of any proposed actions. This notice is a combined effort, so I thank the team from the various bureaus for briefing me and for their dedicated work on this item. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is little doubt that several foreign nations present geopolitical problems for the United States, from state-sponsored terrorism and military aggression outside their borders to economic espionage and market manipulation. We certainly have our fair share of international challenges. Certain nations do everything possible to evade accepted processes for purposes of improving their economic position, harming American companies, and or helping spread their morally bankrupt view of accepted government. Their deceit does not go unnoticed, and their desire to artificially prop up their companies should not be allowed to stand. In the communications era, our concerns are many. It's why I've called for greater U.S. leadership and engagement to prevent harmful outcomes at the ITU at the ICANN and various multi-stakeholder standard body, setting bodies. Moreover, we rightly should be concerned and act against efforts by foreign governments to capture dominant market positions and global share in the communications equipment sector using illegal and underhanded practices. At the same time, we need to be concerned about the infiltration of potentially nefarious equipment within our networks. That gets us to today's item. I appreciate the chairman bringing it forward for our consideration. Substantively, while I firmly believe that there are significant potential threats to our nation's communications networks from foreign suppliers, I do have some concerns regarding the proposed solution to cut off USF support under select circumstances. However, it's my opinion that this NPRM process is the correct vehicle for discussing and resolving such debates. Commenters can highlight what exact benefits this decision could bring, whether money is, of course, completely fungible, and whether other actions should be taken instead. The, cumul the accumulated record should help frame views on any final actions in this matter. I realize that this may create some uncertainty for USF recipients, but we are discussing issues and actions affecting national security, and that must be given due consideration. Along those lines, it is critical that the FCC revise our dealings with what is known as Team Telecom. The issue raises a host of issues in which the Commission will need to work with those in the executive branch on matters involving what equipment poses national security risks, potential waivers, and other critical decisions. That means we're going to have to have a better process than the opaque and unnecessarily lengthy one that exists under the current Team Telecom structure. I'm pleased that the chairman agrees with me on this point, and I look forward to moving a related team telecom order in the very near future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Americans benefit from world-leading communications networks thanks to our country's exceptional commitment to the free market. To be sure, the government has a role in promoting network deployment, including by reducing regulatory barriers and auctioning spectrum. But it was the private sector that put over 1.6 trillion capital at risk and built the next generation networks that are now the envy of the world. Our reliance on the free market has many benefits for consumers. We don't, or at least no longer, impose utility style regulations on the internet, which sacrifice competition for government control. We don't impose mandatory unbundling obligations, which skew investment decisions and deter network deployment. And we certainly don't have a nationalized communications network. But unleashing the private sector to build and operate networks means that private companies are also charged with defending critical infrastructure. And the private sector is deploying substantial resources to secure their networks from attack, whether those attacks stem from individual efforts, uh, a company, or a state actor. In fact, I visited Cable Labs outside Boulder, Colorado two months ago and saw some of the good work industry is doing to help secure our communications infrastructure. The federal government also has a role to play. Indeed, the federal government has been engaged in a decades-long effort to enhance the security of communications networks and their supply chains. In 2013, for example, the White House directed federal agencies to work together to increase the security of communications infrastructure. In 2017, Congress passed legislation prohibiting federal agencies from using 
any products provided by certain companies. And just yesterday, the Commerce Department banned the export of components to a foreign manufacturer that repeatedly evaded sanctions aimed at strengthening our national security. Over the years, the FCC has taken targeted actions as well. We've prohibited companies that have been <clears throat> barred from bidding on federal contracts for national security reasons from participating in our spectrum auctions. We consider national security and foreign policy concerns in evaluating a company's application to operate communications infrastructure in the U.S. And we've established CISRIC as an advisory council charged with providing recommendations to ensure the security of our communications networks, among other actions. As threats continue to evolve, we must continue our work on this front. That means supporting the private sector's efforts, coordinating with our fellow agencies, and exercising our own authority, however limited, to advance the security of communications networks. We do that through this notice by proposing to cut off Universal Service Fund subsidies for the purchase of equipment or services from companies that pose a national security threat to our communications networks or supply chains. That's a very reasonable proposal. Americans shouldn't be paying for equipment that undermines our national security. But I'm also glad that my colleagues have agreed to broaden the scope of this proceeding in two important respects. First, we now seek additional information that will allow us to more fully assess the scope and nature of any threats and thus assess the cost and benefits of our decision. Second, the notice now explores a broader set of options from remedying any threats we identify. For instance, we now ask about more than just USF-funded equipment. And the notice now tees up additional remedies from testing regimes, which have been employed by some of our closest allies, to actions related to the removal or prospective deployment of equipment. I want to thank my colleagues and the chairman for agreeing to put all of these options on the table. Strengthening our national security will continue to be a top priority for the FCC, and this notice will advance that interest, so I'm glad to support it. Thank you to the staffs of the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Public Safety Bureau for your diligent work on this item. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Today, the Commission considers a notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks comment on a rule to prohibit the future use of universal service funds to purchase equipment or services from providers identified as posing a national security risk. Congress has repeatedly expressed concern about the potential for supply chain vulnerability to undermine national security, so I will vote to approve. But our communications networks face other security threats that we cannot continue to ignore. Earlier this month, it was reported that the Department of Homeland Security acknowledged in a letter to Senator Ron Wyden that cell site simulators are being used in the nation's capital, potentially by foreign or criminal actors. These surveillance tools can transform our cell phones into real-time tracking devices by mimicking legitimate cell towers, and some may even have the technical capability to record the content of calls. If these reports are true, someone needs to explain how foreign actors are transmitting over our airwaves without approval from this agency. Someone also needs to explain whether the devices being used have been certified by the FCC. The security of our communications is at stake right here, right now in Washington, and this agency on this issue owes the public more than silence. America's communications networks have become the indispensable infrastructure of our economy and our everyday lives. And that makes safeguarding those networks vitally important to our national security, our economic security, and our personal security. An important part of that security is the integrity of the communications supply chain. That is the process by which products and services are manufactured, distributed, sold, and ultimately integrated into our networks. For years, U.S. government officials have expressed concern about the national security threats posed by certain foreign communications equipment providers in the communications supply chain. Hidden backdoors to our networks and routers, switches, and other network equipment 
can allow hostile foreign powers to inject viruses and other malware, to steal Americans' private data, to spy on U.S. businesses, and to do more. These threats persist today. Just two months ago, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation testified before Congress about the risks of allowing any company or entity that is beholden to foreign governments that don't share our values to gain positions of power inside our telecommunications networks. These risks include, as he put it, the capacity to maliciously modify or steal information and conduct undetected espionage. And, according to the director of of the National Security Agency, This is a challenge that is only going to increase, not lessen, over time for us. Now, to be sure, the FCC doesn't have authority to solve this problem on its own, but it does have a role to play in meeting this challenge. Specifically, given the Commission's responsibility for overseeing the almost $9 billion Universal Service Fund, or USF, we must ensure that the money in the USF, money which comes from fees paid by American consumers, is not used in a way that undermines our national security. And we must take this action now, especially as we stand upon the precipice of the 5G future. And that is why we are proposing a rule that, going forward, prohibits universal service support from being used to purchase or obtain any equipment or services produced or provided by any company posing a national security threat to our communications networks or to the communications supply chain. We seek public input on how best to implement this proposal, including the costs and benefits of doing so. We also ask what types of equipment and services should be covered by the proposed rule, how we should identify which suppliers are covered, and how USF recipients can learn who those suppliers are. I'm confident that the record we compile will allow us to do our part to help protect America's national security. As my colleagues have noted, this notice was clearly a team effort, and I would like to thank as well the terrific staff from across the Commission's bureaus and offices, the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the International Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, and the offices of General Counsel, Communications Business Opportunities, Legislative Affairs, Managing Directors, and uh, Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis. This work could not have been done without you. I'm also grateful to the bipartisan group of senators and representatives that has urged the SEC to take action on this issue. Led by Senator Tom Cotton, these members have been strong advocates for protecting our communications networks from national security threats. And I look forward to working with them toward achieving that important goal. With that, we will proceed to a vote. Commissioner Clyburn? Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Aye. Commissioner Rosenmersel? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, you can now take us to the next item on today's agenda. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the second item on your agenda, entitled Auctions of Upper Microwave Flexible Use Licenses for Next Generation Wireless Services, Competitive Bidding Procedures for Auctions 101 and 102, will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau And Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Mr. Stockdale, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I am pleased to present to you the Spectrum Frontiers Auction Comment PM. I am joined at the table today by Joel Taubenblatt, Margie Wiener, and Katie Hinton, In addition to the staff at the table, I would like to thank the Commission's staff listed on the slide for their input. Katie will now present the item. Thank you, Don. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today's public notice would propose and seek comment on application and bidding procedures for two auctions of approximately 6,000 upper microwave flexible use service licenses in the 28 gigahertz band and the 24 gigahertz band, respectively. As established in the 2016 and 2017 Spectrum Frontiers orders, the 1.55 gigahertz of spectrum available in these auctions will be licensed on a geographic area basis, with the 28 gigahertz licenses offered in two 425 megahertz blocks by county, and the 24 gigahertz licenses offered in seven 100 megahertz blocks by Partial Economic Area, or PEA. 
the public notice would propose to offer these licenses through two auctions with separate application and bidding processes for each auction. This proposal would provide for different formats for the auctions to accommodate the differences in the characteristics of the licenses available in the two bands and to streamline the bidding process for participants where possible. The public notice would announce that the bidding for the 28 gigahertz band designated as auction 101 is scheduled to commence on November 14, 2018 and the bidding for the 24 gigahertz band designated as auction 102 will be scheduled to commence subsequent to the conclusion of bidding in auction 101. The auction of the 28 gigahertz band, auction 101, would employ the commission's standard simultaneous multiple round auction format. This format offers the opportunity to bid on any individual license at the same time and consists of successive bidding rounds. This license by license auction format is appropriate for the 28 gigahertz band because of the number and characteristics of the available licenses. The auction of the 24 gigahertz band, auction 102, would employ a clock auction format, which would allow bidding on generic blocks within categories in each PEA in, su in successive clock bidding rounds. The public notice would also propose procedures for the assignment phase that would allow bidding for frequency-specific license assignments while ensuring contiguous block assignments. The auction 102 format would be similar to the forward auction portion of the broadcast incentive auction. A clock auction format is appropriate for the relatively unencumbered 24 gigahertz band, since blocks can be treated as largely interchangeable or generic, and bidding for generic blocks followed by an assignment phase will speed up auction 102 considerably relative to a simultaneous multiple round auction. The public notice would also propose separate application filing windows, one for auction 101 and one for auction 102, and would seek comment on whether auction 102 applications should be accepted prior to the close of bidding in auction 101. Under that scheduling scenario, entities wishing to participate in either auction would be applicants during overlapping periods of time. Accordingly, if auction 102 applications are accepted before the close of bidding in auction 101, the public notice would propose to apply certain of the commission's auction rules, such as the prohibition on certain communications across both auctions, given the potential bidders may be interested in participating in both auctions. In addition, the public notice would propose bidding credit caps of $25 million for small businesses and $10 million for rural service providers, as well as a $10 million cap on the overall amount of bidding credits that any winning small business bidder in either auction may apply to winning licenses in markets with a population of 500,000 or less. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau recommends adoption of this public notice and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hinton, for the presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. When we adopted the first order in the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding nearly two years ago, I recall mentioning those pockets in our nation where too many remain stuck in a 2G and, 5, and 3G, they wish for 5G, reality. Our goals for 5G should include ubiquity and affordability, I said, and the U.S. will only truly win the 5G race if all of our citizens benefit. One way in which this agency can assist in achieving these goals is through the promotion of competition in the spectrum bands above 24 gigahertz. And while our policies have greatly benefited from the filings of a wide range of parties, on how best to design our license and service rules to advance competition, competition in the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding, we still need input so that our auction procedures are as proactive as possible. In the initial draft of this auction's comment public notice, I was concerned about us creating an unnecessary problem by proposing to permit the filing of applications for auction 102 before the close of auction 101. The notice clearly lays out the reasons why we should have, must have, a sep, a sep, why we must have separate auctions, explains that we want 
to encourage participation and competition in both auctions and acknowledges that permitting the filing of applications for auction 102 before the close of auction 101 could be problematic for those wanting to bid in both auctions. <clears throat> I think I have with Europe. Uh -oh. <laughs> Always happy to I share. don't want what you have. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank my colleagues for agreeing to my request to no longer propose, but simply seek comment on whether the commission should adopt applications for the second auction before the first one closes. I also appreciate the support for a statement that the commission will resolve pending issues from the 2017 Spectrum Frontiers for the notice of proposed rulemaking that are relevant to holding auctions for the 28 and 24 gigahertz bands. <clears throat> One of the key issues raised in that further notice is the proposal to repeal the pre-auction spectrum limit to participate in millimeter wave auctions. But in order to supply interested bidders with a clear set of rules and to determine whether these auctions comply with Section 309J of the Communications Act Directive, that we should avoid an undue concentration of licenses, it is important that we resolve this issue. However, we should resolve the applications for review of the Bureau orders that granted license transfers from Straight Path to Verizon and Fiber Tower to AT&T before determining if we should repeal the pre-auction spectrum limits. When the Commission decided to have a spectrum threshold to assess the competitive impact of concentration of millimeter wave spectrum, it included a 28 and 39 gigahertz spectrum in that analysis. Therefore, before deciding whether the Commission should reverse its 2016 decision that a pre-auction spectrum limit serves the public interest, the full Commission should have the opportunity to address the arguments being made in those applications for review as to the competitive impact that those transactions have on 5G services. I am, however, disappointed that my colleagues did not support my request for a line of questions on whether the, rather the Commission should auction the 24 gigahertz band before 28. I agree that there are pros and cons to whichever bands the Commission offers the Commission auctions first. For example, since the 24 gigahertz band is Greenfield, it may generate more interest than the 28 gigahertz band. But by not asking the question, we send the signal that the Commission would not even entertain any argument on leading with 24. Why we, would we want to prejudge these views now? I encourage those that believe that auctioning the 24 gigahertz band would better serve the public interest to still file comments making that point. Now, while I obviously had concerns with certain portions of this auction's comment notice, I wish to thank Don Stockdale and his team in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for briefing me as well as their presentations this morning. When I vote, Mr. Chairman, I will concur. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. <clears throat> I appreciate the efforts of Chairman Pai to schedule the much-needed 24 and 28 gigahertz auctions and for bringing this item to the Commission. By moving forward, we are reaffirming our commitment to providers that they will have the spectrum resources they need to deploy 5G technologies, as well as to all Americans, that the United States will remain the leader in wireless technologies. This item is a harbinger of good things to come. In the next few months, I look forward to receiving an item that will resolve the remaining issues presented by the petitions for reconsideration to the 2016 order and those raised by the accompanying further notice. We also have to take steps to open up remaining bands, such as 32, 42, 50 gigahertz in the 2016 further notice. We also must start the process to allocate additional bands, such as 26 gigahertz, for commercial wireless services. Additionally, we need to schedule auctions for the 37 and 39 gigahertz bands immediately and create an auction timeline for the other bands coming down the pipeline. Affected industry needs to know as soon as possible when they need the resources to participate in what has become a necessary ingredient in 5G services. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. The FCC has been moving aggressively 
to ensure the United States can win the global race to 5G. Last month, we took concrete steps to enable more Americans to benefit from 5G by modernizing our approach to the deployment of wireless infrastructure. On the spectrum side, we were the first country in the world to allocate high band spectrum for 5G. And with this public notice, we're taking the next step towards bringing over 1.5 gigahertz of millimeter wave spectrum to auction. The chairman deserves credit for pressing ahead and ensuring we were ready to hold these auctions as soon as Congress provided us with the authority to do so. The FCC's forward-leaning approach to 5G benefits everyday Americans. You see, 5G is about more than an abstract broadband speed or lower latency. It's about enabling the next generation of entrepreneurship and innovation in America. It's about autonomous cars, which could reduce the number of traffic deaths from 40,000 per year we see today to nearly zero. It's about the industrial Internet of Things and smart city applications. And it's about delivering remote surgery and telehealth applications to communities that today lack the health care options they deserve. We're already seeing glimpses of this connected future. Just last week, I visited a ranch in the rural Amargosa Valley of Nevada. Ponderosa Dairies has 15,000 cows, and each is tagged with an RFID chip, so they joke that these are connected cows. The RFID chips track the livestock and report back vital information on their health. In turn, this data is transmitted over a wireless connection to a veterinarian who lives a number of states away. A few months before that, I visited Mississippi, where C Spire is testing 5G technologies, and I toured the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Using wireless broadband, they're bringing health care services to rural communities that would otherwise lack access to specialists or even basic care. Through remote patient monitoring, the center helps screen and treat patients with diabetes living in some of the most rural parts of the Magnolia State. And before my trip to Mississippi, I visited General Electric in Houston and learned about their work developing 5G Internet of Things and remote monitoring applications that can drive greater efficiencies and productivity across many sectors of our economy. As interesting as these experiences all were, they're only a hint at the new innovations we could see as next generation networks come online. But back in the here and now, we have work to do to enable this future. And that work includes adopting the detailed and admittedly weedy technical rules for our first high band spectrum auction. So I'm glad we're starting that process today. As we do so, the FCC will continue to move quickly to identify and auction additional spectrum bands for 5G and other innovative uses. I want to thank the Wireless Bureau for its work on this item and for its continuing <laughs> efforts as we proceed to auction. This item has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Earlier this year, as country after country announced plans to hold auctions for fifth generation or 5G wireless, I wrote in TechCrunch that the United States should be first. If our experience with wireless technology cycles has shown us anything, it's that being there in the beginning matters. After trailing our European counterparts in the rollout of 3G mobile services, we were the first to deploy the next generation 4G. That leadership paid dividends. An entire ecosystem of devices, operating systems, and services grew up around our networks and all this mobile activity. Of course, we can't rest on our laurels, and that is why it's troubling that this agency has watched as South Korea, Germany, Australia, the United Kingdom, and Romania have already announced plans for 5G auctions. China also has big plans in the works with significant amounts of mid-band and high-band spectrum already identified for 5G. But today, thankfully, the agency takes steps to put ourselves back in the running. So I'm glad that the chairman and my colleagues are ready to get back on track. Today we schedule our first 5G auction and finally get out of the starting gate. We start with the 28 gigahertz band and follow with the 24 gigahertz band, and this is real progress. However, from here on out, we need to do more than just join the pack with an auction 
in 2018. If we want to lead, we need a pipeline of both millimeter wave and mid-band spectrum for 5G. That means making transparent our plans for every subsequent auction. We can do this with something very simple, a calendar. Let's publish a calendar that states clearly to the entire wireless ecosystem, from existing providers to new spectrum interests to manufacturers and consumers, just when and how the FCC will auction new airwaves to support 5G services. That's what leadership entails, and that's what we need to do. Thank you, Commissioner. The recent Winter Olympics featured a number of firsts. It was the first Winter Games hosted by South Korea. It was the first time the United States won a gold medal in curling. And most relevant to our work at the FCC, it was the first Olympics to debut 5G technology, the next generation of wireless connectivity. The FCC has been working hard to do what we need to do to ensure American leadership in 5G. Last month, we updated our wireless infrastructure rules to make sure that the physical networks of the future can exist. And this month, we turn our attention to 5G's invisible building blocks by kicking off the Spectrum auction process. As I announced in March, the FCC intends to hold in November an auction of Spectrum of 28 gigahertz uh, of the 28 gigahertz band, followed immediately thereafter by an auction of Spectrum in the 24 gigahertz band. Now, to meet that timeline, we need to move quickly, and that is what we are doing today. We set the foundation for America's first millimeter wave auctions by seeking input on application and bidding procedures for the auction of 28 gigahertz and 24 gigahertz licenses. It may not be flashy, but this is a vital step toward promoting U.S. innovation in 5G wireless services, the Internet of Things, and many technological firsts in these previously underused high band frequencies. It is also important to mention that we will be able to commence spectrum auctions later this year because of recent legislative action. I'm grateful to Congress for passing and the President for signing legislation fixing a technical problem involving upfront payments by auction bidders for spectrum. While this problem stood in the way of the FCC holding a major spectrum auction, I'm grateful that we were able to roll up our sleeves and work together on a bipartisan basis with Congress and the executive branch to remove this roadblock. And we intend to take advantage of this cleared lane. After completing auctions for the 28 and 24 gigahertz bands, we anticipate auctioning additional bands in the near future. I too would like to thank the staff who worked on this item, Eric Beith, Craig Bromberger, Steve Wenzo, Chaz Eberly, Katie Hinton, William Huber, Gary Michaels, Linda Sanderson, John Schaubel, Blaise Sinto, Martha Stansel, Stu Sterner, Don Stockdale, Joel Tabenblatt, and Margie Wiener from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and Lawrence Atlas, David Horowitz, Bill Richardson, and Anjali Singh of the Office of General Counsel. To say the least, we will continue to rely upon your expertise as we approach the November 14th start of the 28 gigahertz auction. With that, we'll proceed to a vote. Commissioner Clyburn. Concur. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the terrific work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, item three, entitled Streamlining Licensing Procedures for Small Satellites, will be presented by the International Bureau, and Tom Sullivan, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you. Uh, Chief Sullivan, whenever you and your folks are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. The International Bureau is very pleased to present you with this notice of proposed rulemaking, which proposes to streamline the application process for a category of satellites often referred to as small satellites. These proposals, if adopted, will facilitate a more accessible and flexible authorization process for this dynamic segment of the commercial satellite communications market. I'm joined at the table by Troy Tanner, Deputy Chief of the International Bureau, Jose Albuquerque, Chief of the Satellite Division, Carl Kensinger, Deputy Chief, Marissa Velez, Attorney Advisor in the Satellite Policy Branch, and Christopher Baer, also an Attorney Advisor in the Satellite Policy Branch. I would also like to acknowledge the outstanding contributions on this item from other staff in the Bureau, including Steve Duell, 
Jennifer Gilsonin, Dardalene Meme, and Sankara Prasad, as well as our colleagues <coughs> excuse me, from the Office of General Counsel, Office of Engineering and Technology, and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Marissa will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Small satellites, which have relatively short duration missions, have traditionally been utilized for scientific missions by universities and other research entities. Now, they are increasingly being used for commercial endeavors, such as Earth observation data. However, the Commission's licensing rules that apply to these types of systems were not developed with small satellite systems in mind. The notice of proposed rulemaking proposes a streamlined application and licensing process tailored specifically to these small satellite operations. One key characteristic of these systems is use of small portions of the radio frequency spectrum. Small satellite systems targeted by this proposal have less intensive spectrum use as compared with non-geostationary systems that provide ubiquitous, always available services because these small satellites typically have short missions and communicate with a limited number of Earth stations or transmit only at certain times of day when they're passing over specific locations on Earth. Consistent with these characteristics, the draft NPRM proposes that small satellite applicants under this new process demonstrate that they can share use of spectrum and that they would not unreasonably preclude future operations in the authorized frequency bands. Other characteristics include, as proposed, fewer than 10 satellites under a single authorization, a single satellite mass of less than 180 kilograms, a total orbital lifetime for the satellites of five years or less, and deployment of satellites that lack propulsion into an altitude of 400 kilometers or below, which is below the International Space Station. Several of these characteristics are intended to readily identify systems that have a relatively low risk of creating orbital debris and are therefore suitable for streamlined processing. The NPRM proposes that applicants qualified for this small satellite process would be exempt from the processing round procedures that are normally applicable to non-geostationary satellite systems. In addition, the NPRM proposes to adopt a one-year grace period from posting of the surety bond, since these systems typically become operational soon after authorization. In addition to the streamlining proposals, the NPRM also considers other spectrum issues, such as the use of frequency bands that are currently allocated to satellite services, coordination with other services, and use of inter-satellite communications by small satellites. Finally, we consider revision to the application fee for small satellites applying under the new streamlined process. Recognizing the burgeoning small satellite sector and the unique characteristics associated with small satellite operations, and with the goal of making the authorization process more accessible for small satellite systems, the Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Phyllis, for that excellent presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench. Commissioner Clyburn. Great things come in small packages. Now, the first time those of us of a certain height attach real meaning to this phrase, it came on the heels of being consoled after being made to feel exceptionally small and inadequate because of the words or hands of a playground bully. Sorry, I just had a flashback. <laughs> Today, however, this oft-recited phrase <coughs> can be used to describe several trends taking place in the technology and communications industries. The first commercial cell phone was literally the size of a brick. Today's smartphones fit into our back pocket, pockets. In the 1960s and 70s, you needed a room the size of a huge, huge office to house that generation's supercomputer. Now, our smartphones in our purses contain more computing power than all at NASA back in 1969. A few years back, researchers at the University of Illinois developed batteries only a few millimeters in size and they can be used to jumpstart a car. And as long as consumers continue to demand portability when it comes to their electronic devices, and as long as there are engineers working on satisfying that demand, we should expect the trend towards smaller devices 
by way of size to continue. This shrinking trend when it comes to our technology devices is now impacting the satellite industry. Small satellites are being deployed into orbit efficiently and cost-effectively for a variety of uses. We are seeing rising numbers of holders of experimental and amateur licenses for small satellite systems seek authorization of those systems for commercial use. The earth imagery and other information from these systems are being used by the tech industry to develop big data technologies for a variety of applications. One such application is in the field of agriculture, Commissioner Carr, where satellite and other data is being used to improve crop yields. <laughs> Small satellite systems are also being used for space and cloud data and analytics, providing advanced maritime, aviation, and weather tracking. Today, the FCC rightly acknowledges this trend in the commercial industry and proposes new licensing procedures that should facilitate greater investment and innovation. Providing for one streamlined set of procedures and seeking comment on how we can tailor our Part 25 license and service rules for small satellite systems means that we are off to a great start. I am in full support of today's item and thank Tom Sullivan and an International Bureau for an impressive notice of proposed rulemaking and to reaffirm that indeed great things come in small packages. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. I'm going to put my uh, statement in for the record to thank the chair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Both on the ground and beyond Earth's atmosphere, wireless technology is getting smaller. On the terrestrial side, upwards of 80% of new deployments are small cells, and we're seeing a similar trend in space. Smaller, less expensive satellites are being deployed in increasing numbers. In fact, the U.S. now leads the world in small sat launches. Americans stand to benefit from these commercial deployments with use cases ranging from the Internet of Things to smart agricultural applications. So yes, Commissioner Clyburn, uh, there is an even brighter future ahead for those connected cows. <laughs> As policymakers, we need to make sure our rules keep pace with these changes in technology. And that means ensuring that our regulations are right-sized and tailored to reflect the costs and impacts of these innovations. Last month, the FCC recognized this principle when we voted to exempt small wireless facilities from regulatory procedures designed for large towers. The record showed that by subjecting small cells to large-scale regulations, we were discouraging broadband deployment in those communities that need it most and threatening to undermine the United States' efforts to win the race to 5G. In the, this notice, we recognize that the same problem could exist for small satellites. While our traditional Part 25 approach for processing satellite applic applications involves legal, technical, in other showings that may make sense for large satellites or big constellations, the regulatory costs associated with these reviews can prevent the business case for small sats from getting off the ground. So I'm glad we're now proposing to define a new category of small sats and seeking comment on streamlined approval procedures. This step should help encourage investment and innovation in small sats while continuing to promote our interests in limiting orbital debris and protecting against harmful interference. An oversized regulatory burden should never be what stands in the way of progress. So I'm pleased to support this proposal. I want to thank the staffs of the International Bureau and the Wireless Bureau for their hard work on this item. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Welcome to the second space age. During the first, which began with the end of the Second World War, Space missions depended on the prowess of our superpowers. This was for good reason. Going to space was out of this world expensive. Missions were awe-inspiring, but rare. But this new space age is different. It relies on radically new technologies and business models. It features a much wider range of space interests and actors. Satellites are smaller. Crowdfunded constellations are possible, and space tourism is no longer simply a dream. 
In short, we have many more reasons to reach for the stars. So today, we take steps to tailor our licensing framework for this new era. That's important. Across the board, we need to do more to prepare for the proliferation of satellites headed to higher altitudes. To this end, in this rulemaking, we seek comment on an alternative application process for small satellites, ask questions about on-orbit lifetime, and explore issues of maneuverability and trackability. We also seek comment on new frequencies for new constellations of small satellites. I look forward to the record that develops. But to be truly prepared for the second space age, I think there are two additional issues that deserve our attention right now. First, the FCC needs to tackle the growing challenge of orbital debris. At present, the risk of debris generating collisions is reasonably low. Still, they have happened. And as more actors participate in the space industry with larger satellite constellations, the frequencies of these accidents is going to increase. And unchecked, growing debris in orbit could make some regions of space unusable for decades to come. That's not an acceptable outcome. It's why we need right now to develop a comprehensive policy to mitigate collision risks and ensure space sustainability. Second, the FCC needs to coordinate more closely with other federal authorities to figure out just what our national policies are for this jumble of new space activity. Right now, the National Space Council is considering policy changes to help promote the growth of the commercial space industry. Their efforts encompass everything from streamlining licenses to reforming export controls to protecting airwaves facilitating space activities. Its membership spans the civil, military, and commercial sectors and includes the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Homeland Security, and Director of National Intelligence. Representatives from the Office of Management and Budget, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, among others, also serve on this council. It's an impressive list. But the FCC should have a seat at this table. It's a glaring omission that this agency does not, because through our oversight of the airwaves and licensing of satellite services, we have an important role ensuring the viability of space for future generations. Cutting the FCC out of this discussion is an unseemly mistake and one that deserves a fix. Thank you, Commissioner. A few weeks ago, I got to see NASA launch the SpaceX Dragon cargo vehicle up towards the International Space Station. That was admittedly pretty cool. But arguably cooler was getting to visit Launch Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. That's where numerous historic space, space missions launched, including Apollo 11, which sent the first humans to the moon, and Apollo 13, the so-called successful failure, which set a record for the farthest distance humans ever traveled from Earth. It is a testament to human ingenuity that since those missions, we've expanded the variety and increased the quantity of objects launched into space, including recently a car. In recent years, for example, smaller, less expensive satellites with short duration missions, often known as small sats or small satellites, that are often used for scientific research by universities and increasingly used for commercial operations, have also been developed and launched into space. Their numbers have grown and with them, a problem. More satellites means more regulatory reviews, but our current rules weren't designed with these smaller satellites in mind. And so today we begin the process for solving this problem. We aim to streamline the process for authorizing commercial small satellite operations. If operators want to launch satellites with certain characteristics, such as short orbital lifetimes, they could choose to file under a new alternative small satellite process. These procedures would be less burdensome while still preserving the FCC's interest in issues like efficient spectrum use and limiting orbital debris. We also seek uh, public input on a number of questions, including about application fees that will inform our decision making as we consider implementing this new process. This is yet another measure the FCC is taking to address one of its own continuing missions, encouraging innovation through next generation technologies, easing the regulatory burdens for new space missions and research using small satellites will ultimately benefit everyone 
from academic researchers to small businesses. Thanks to the dedicated staff who worked on this item from the International Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Office of Managing Director, and the Office of General Counsel. With that, we'll proceed to a vote. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner Riley? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks, folks, for the terrific work. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fourth item on your agenda will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau, and it is entitled Rule Call Completion. Once again, Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thanks. Back to earth we go. Uh, Chief Monteith, it's uh, up to you. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would adopt, propose, and seek comment on new measures to better tackle the problem of call completion and ensure that calls are completed to all Americans, including those in rural America. I would like to thank the entire Bureau team for their hard work on this item as well as our colleagues in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs and Enforcement Bureaus and the Offices of General Counsel and Strategic Planning for their review and helpful feedback. Seated at the table with me are Dewana Terry, Associate Bureau Chief, and from the Competition Policy Division, Dan Kahn, Division Chief, and Alex Espinoza, Attorney Advisor. Alex will now present the item. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, good morning. The item before you seeks to reorient the Commission's ex- existing roll call completion rules to better reflect strategies that have worked to more effectively address roll call completion issues, while at the same time reducing the overall burden of our rules on providers. First, the report and order adopts a new rule requiring covered providers, namely long distance providers that select the initial long distance path to monitor the performance of intermediate providers to which they hand off calls. This monitoring requirement would create a duty for cover providers to prospectively evaluate the intermediate providers with which they contract to prevent reasonably foreseeable rule call completion problems. In addition, cover providers would have a duty to retrospectively investigate any rule call completion problems that arise and to take steps that are reasonably calculated to to correct any identified performance problem with the intermediate provider. The report and order would also require cover providers to make available a point of contact to address roll call completion issues. Second, the item's further notice of proposed rulemaking, if adopted, proposes and seeks comment on rules to implement the recently enacted Improving Rule Call Quality and Reliability Act of 2017, the RCC Act, which directs the Commission to establish an intermediate provider registry and service quality standards for intermediate providers. The further notice also seeks comment on further reform to the Commission's roll call completion rules. Specifically, The further notice proposes requiring that any intermediate provider register with the commission if that provider offers or holds itself out as offering the capability to transmit covered voice communications from one destination to another and and charges any rate to any other entity, including affiliates, for the transmission. The resulting registry would be made publicly available on the commission's website. The further notice also proposes to require intermediate providers subject to the RCC Act to take reasonable steps to abide by certain industry best practices for roll call completion and to require intermediate providers that have processes in place to monitor their own roll call completion performance. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Espinoza, for the presentation. We'll now turn to Commissioner Clyburn for comments. Five years ago, we adopted the first report in order on roll call completion. Today, We reaffirm our commitment to all Americans, especially those living in rural America, that every call matters. Call failures impose high economic and personal costs, frustrate our universal service goals, and undermine a carrier's obligations to provide service without discrimination or undue prejudice to any locality. During times of emergency, even one call failure can be a threat to public safety and have disastrous results for everyone involved. 
the second report in order, and third, further notice, takes additional measures and proposes further improvements for Americans living in rural areas who deserve the same degree of long-distance call reliability most Americans enjoy. The item requires covered providers to monitor the performance of the intermediate providers to which they hand off calls. They must take reasonable steps to correct call completion issues, including removing the intermediate provider from a route after sustained inadequate performance. Today, we leave no doubt that the covered provider is the one responsible for call completion issues, which enhances our ability to take enforcement action. I would like to thank my colleagues for remaining vigilant on this critical issue and including language directing the FCC staff to continue to monitor the state of call completion over the next several years and issue a report on the progress and effectiveness of our rules. The stakes are high, and we cannot rest until this problem is no more. For accommodating my other request to reduce and resolve any discovered call completion issues without the delay, I again thank my colleagues. These changes include treating adherence to the best practices in the ADDIS Rule Call Completion Handbook as a safe harbor and requiring covered providers to respond to rule carriers complaining of rule call completion issues within a single business day. The changes preserve carriers' flexibility to implement our rules while assuring that the main goal of in of ensuring all Americans have access to reliable communication services is being fulfilled. I would like to thank the team for the Wireline Competition Bureau for the dedicated work to ensure that rural America receives every single call intended. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to insert my statement for the record. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. In February, Congress passed legislation on rural call completion. It did so based on its determination that consumers continue to experience persistent problems with the completion of long-distance calls in rural areas. In too many cases, Congress found, calls simply don't go through, consumers receive false busy signals, or they're unable to hear the person on the other end of the line. Often, the problem can be traced back to what are known as intermediate providers. As part of an effort to limit the costs of terminating traffic, the first provider in the call chain will often select the cheapest intermediate provider, even though qual quality can suffer as a result of that decision or the introduction of additional intermediate providers further down the call chain. Congress focused on this problem by authorizing the FCC to take targeted action regarding the use of intermediate providers. So I'm glad that we're initiating a further notice today that will implement this legislation, including by requiring intermediate providers to register with the FCC and comply with minimum service quality requirements. Taking these steps will enhance our oversight capabilities and better prevent the call completion problems we've been seeing to date. I'm also pleased that the order portion of today's decision will eliminate the FCC's 2013 reporting requirements, which the record shows have not proven to be worth their costs. We replace that ineffective approach with a new monitoring requirement, which should provide better checks on the performance of intermediate providers. In this regard, I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to edits that clarify the scope of this new monitoring requirement. Changes that make clear we're focused on ensuring providers make reasonable efforts to address persistent call problems. Moreover, since we are relying on covered providers using contractual provisions to address the conduct of intermediate providers, I also want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to establish a reasonable transition period for providers to review their contracts and implement any necessary changes. These revisions will help ensure that carriers have the flexibility to conduct monitoring in the way that works best for their respective networks, while also providing certainty about the FCC's expectations. With these changes, the item has my support. 
So thank you to the staff of the Waterland Competition Bureau for your work on the item. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. This is about trust. When you pick up the phone to place a call, you should have every confidence that your call will go through. But in too many places in rural America, that is not happening. Calls to friends and family will ring and ring and ring without even being answered. Business connections will never get made. And worse, calls in times of crisis to public safety may not go through. For too long, consumers in rural communities and the carriers that serve them have complained about this problem. And over the last few years, the FCC has dutifully answered their call, putting in place reporting obligations designed to fix this problem. It also has taken enforcement action against those carriers that fail to deliver calls. And yet, the problem persists. So today, we fine-tune our prior efforts to help end this problem. We also implement the Rural Call Quality and Reliability Act, which was signed into law earlier this year. So I approve this order and rulemaking, but I am also mindful that our work today may still need further adjustment, because in the end, the only acceptable outcome is putting an end to this problem and restoring trust. That may be a tall order for this agency, but it's a task we need to take on with vigor. Thank you, Commissioner. All Americans should have confidence that when a telephone call is made to them, their phone will ring. But that's not always the case in parts of rural America. Call failures ranging from dead air to messages incorrectly saying that a number is not in service are a nuisance that can have costly repercussions. And unfortunately, despite FCC action on this issue in 2013 with rules being adopted, this problem hasn't gone away. Today's order reflects what I believe will be a more effective approach for tackling rural call completion problems. Specifically, the order requires covered providers to monitor the performance of so-called intermediate providers. Now, intermediate providers are entities that carry a call somewhere along the way to its destination, and they are often the cause of call completion problems. Holding covered providers responsible for addressing call completion issues should reduce the likelihood of a call failure in the middle of the calling chain. Additionally, we end a paperwork requirement, which has proven to be unduly burdensome and not as helpful as we had hoped it would be. The Wireline Competition Bureau found last year that the rule call completion data collection that began in 2013, as they put it, provides a less than clear understanding of the overall state of rural call completion performance. In particular, the Bureau reported that problems with the information collection, quote, preclude us from drawing firm conclusions from the data. Well, that just doesn't cut it. And the requirement mentioned above that covered providers monitor intermediate providers makes this data collection expendable. One last note, recently Congress enacted the Improving Rural Call Quality and Reliability Act of 2017. This legislation imposes new obligations upon the FCC, obligations which are the focus upon the, of the further notice. To help us as we consider how to implement the law, we preserve for now the recording and retention requirements for the data that covered providers previously submitted to the FCC. This ensures that this information will remain available to the Commission if needed as we carry out this new act. Thanks to the many staff that worked on this item from the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Media Bureau, the Office of Strategic Policy, Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, and the Office of General Counsel for the fantastic work. We'll now proceed to a vote. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks, folks, for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Um, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item on your agenda will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and is entitled Regulation of Business Data Services for Rate of Return Local Exchange Carriers. Thank you, Madam Secretary. You're welcome. All right, Ms. Montes, whenever your folks are ready. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration a notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks to promote investment and competition in the business data services, BDS, markets, 
served by rate of return carriers that receive fixed support from the high cost universal service support program. In furtherance of these goals, the notice proposes to give these carriers the option to elect to migrate their lower speed TDM based BDS offerings to incentive based regulation. It also seeks comment on whether to remove ex ante pricing regulation from their higher speed BDS offerings. I would like to thank the Pricing Policy Division staff for their great work on this notice. I would also like to acknowledge the valuable input we received from our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel. With me at the table are Lisa Hone, Associate Bureau Chief, and Eric Ralph, Chief Economist. And from WCB's Pricing Policy Division, Pam Arluck, Division Chief, David Sessiger, Deputy Division Chief, and Justin Falb, Attorney Advisor. Justin will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Good morning. The Commission has long recognized that incentive regulation is preferable to rate of return regulation in promoting efficiency and reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens. In a series of steps over the last three decades, the Commission has acted to encourage local exchange carriers to move from rate of return regulation to incentive regulation. By adopting this notice, the Commission will take another step in that process. The notice proposes to allow rate of return carriers receiving alternative Connect America Cost Model, or ACAM support, to voluntarily migrate their lower speed TDM transport and end user channel termination business data services to incentive based regulatory paradigm. Those ACAM carriers that elect to move their BDS offerings to incentive regulation will be relieved of burdensome rate of return regulation and the requirement to conduct annual cost studies. The result will be to encourage investment, innovation, and competition in the business data services markets served by those carriers to the benefits of consumers. The notice seeks comment on whether to adopt a competitive market test to assess the availability of competition for lower speed TDM BDS offerings in areas served by ACAM carriers and seeks comment on relieving ACAM carriers lower speed TDM BDS offerings of ex ante pricing regulation in areas deemed competitive by a competitive market test. The notice also seeks comment on whether to eliminate ex ante pricing regulation for uh, electing ACAM carriers packet based and higher speed circuit based BDS offerings above a DS3 and to forbear from section 203 tariffing requirements for those services consistent with the rules the Commission adopted in the uh, for price cap carriers last year. The notice reiterates that sections 201, 202, and 208 of the Act would continue to protect consumers from unjust and unreasonable practices. Additionally, the notice proposes to allow other rate of return carriers receiving fixed support to opt into the same incentive regulations proposed for ACAM carriers. Finally, the notice seeks comment on how to transition ACAM carriers to the new regulatory regime and proposes rule corrections to clean up inaccuracies in the rules. The Bureau recommends adoption of the item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you, Mr. Fall. Pith and the pocket square combined, a powerful combination. Uh, we'll now go to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. In an increasingly digitally dependent society, Connectivity is a game changer. It is particularly powerful for small and rural communities. Communities. It allows small locally owned businesses to become major players in the national and global economy, generating and enabling sustainable social and economic growth right there at home. And the business data services, formerly known as special access, formerly known as for, well, anyways. Now I'm <laughs> oh. Played an essential role in supporting that much needed next generation mobile broadband deployment, as well as public safety operations and school and healthcare connectivity, all underscoring the importance of reliable, robust, and affordable communication services. In this notice of proposed rulemaking, we recognize that areas served by rate of return carriers 
are generally less dense, less populated, and have fewer competitive options when compared to areas served by price cap carriers. This means that the data collected for price cap carriers and the competitive market test framework, which the majority adopted in the 2017 BDS order, are not appropriate when it comes to evaluating those rate of return carrier service areas that mo serve mostly small and rural communities. Today's item will allow us to develop a full and accurate record, which we need if we are to eliminate unnecessary regulatory burdens and properly assess the availability of competitive options for last mile BDS services in those areas. Make no mistake, seeking comment to develop a full record is but an, a first step, an important first step to understanding the state of the market and just what is at stake. The next step is much more of a challenge. The regulations we are proposing to evaluate and eliminate if an area is deemed competitive are designed to ensure that BDS if, uh, is offered to those businesses that form the economic backbone of communities across the country at just and reasonable rates. I hope that the forthcoming record will shed light on whether the proposed changes, if adopted, will weaken the Commission's ability to protect consumers or prevent price hikes for small business data services in communities that need those services the most. I will never object to a framework that minimizes regulatory burdens when there is evidence that market forces are sufficient to discipline prices. But we must not repeat the mistakes of the 2017 BDS order, where the majority chased deregulation at all cost. We need reliable data to determine a competitive test. We need to assess the number of providers necessary for true competition to discipline this market, and there needs to be appropriate geographic and product market definitions in our analysis, which is why further stakeholder engagement is needed. Without it, we run the risk that the next step the Commission takes could end in a result I cannot abide, a deeper digital divide. I would like to thank my colleagues for agreeing to my request to seek comment on whether there is sufficient competition to eliminate ex ante price regulation for higher capacity BDS offerings in areas served by rate of return carriers instead of proposing such elimination based on a market analysis that excludes these carriers' market areas. I also thank the team from the Wireline Competition Bureau for your dedication and your hard work on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit a longer statement for the record, but I'll just make a couple of points. I, I support the concept of enabling additional carriers to voluntarily migrate to incentive regulation more broadly and look forward to reviewing the record. The notice also highlights that as carriers transition to price cap regulation, other legacy regulations involving Part 32 accounting, tariffing, cost assignment, and jurisdictional, jurisdictional separations are no longer justified or needed. I'm pleased that the Commission seeks comment on removing or forbearing from these requirements as well. Additionally, with this proceeding underway, there's even less utility in revamping our jurisdictional separations rules for the diminishing number of carriers that could remain subject to them. Accordingly, I reiterate my strong preference that the Commission approve a longer extension of the current freeze than what has been done in the past. This will allow market forces, technological changes, and consumer preferences ultimately to resolve longer-term separation issues. Hopefully, we can address this issue in the very near future. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Last week, as you all no doubt know from following me on Twitter, I had the chance to visit a number of small businesses that are serving rural communities in my wife's home state of Nevada. Places like Beatty, which is population 1010, and Pahrump, which did not even have telephone service until the 1960s. This trip reinforced the role that broadband plays in delivering health care, educational, and economic opportunities 
to Americans across the country. For example, I visited a medical clinic in Beatty that was going to shut down due to the economics of serving such a rural community. But with a new high-speed broadband connection, the clinic can now afford to stay open, to keep Teresa, a nurse, employed there full-time on-site, and to allow patients to visit virtually with a doctor located in a larger town. I also met with students at the local high school and heard about the online testing, distance learning, and educational opportunities that their new broadband connection is enabling. And I met with a woman named LaDonna who's operating a graphics design business in the community thanks to an internet connection. When we talk about bringing more broadband to more Americans, an important part of that discussion centers on rural communities like Beatty and Pahrump. Our universal service program is a key part of the solution in communities like this. Communities where low population densities and high deployment costs erode the private sector business case. But regulatory reform is also a key part of the solution. So the commission must provide the right incentives for carriers to bring broadband to homes and businesses in the hardest to serve parts of the country. That's why I'm glad we're teeing up this notice today. Businesses, both large and small, including schools and medical facilities, rely on what we at the FCC refer to as business data services to connect to the internet. But to date, many small rural carriers have been saddled with legacy regulatory costs that no longer apply to many of their larger competitors. By proposing to remove the overhang of these burdensome pricing rules, we're aiming to free up additional capital that these smaller providers can use to build out their networks, hire new employees, and serve additional customers. This can make a real difference for businesses in rural America. So I want to thank the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau for their hard work on this item. It has my support, and I look forward to reviewing the record as it develops. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenwessel. In the interest of speeding things along, I'm going to forego a statement at this time. I'll just acknowledge that I did not vote on the underlying BDS order from last year, so I intend to look at the record that results from this rulemaking carefully. Thank you, Commissioner. One of my distinguished predecessors, Dennis Patrick, pioneered the idea of replacing rate of return regulation with price cap regulation three decades ago. This was an uphill battle, to say the least. The then chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Telecommunications Subcommittee questioned what he called an untested proposal, saying, and I quote, that jettisoning unproven programs for untested concepts is not my idea of a forward-looking policy. And the then chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, when asked how the price cap plan could be improved, responded curtly, forget it. Yet price cap regulation prevailed, and the decades of experience since have proven Chairman Patrick so right that the intensity of this fight, if not the fight itself, has largely been forgotten. Through Republican and Democratic administrations alike, the FCC has recognized the public benefits of price cap regulation in non-competitive markets. And that brings us to today. In 2016, the FCC allowed rate of return carriers to elect model-based universal service fund support. These carriers are known as ACAM carriers because their support is based on the alternative Connect America cost model. Although they receive some regulatory relief for doing so, carriers choosing model-based support still must adhere to onerous rate of return regulation for their lower speed business data services or BDS offerings. And this means that they must conduct annual cost studies to justify their BDS rates. These cost studies are expensive, and they pull resources away from more productive uses, such as building and maintaining networks. And so today, we propose to allow ACAM carriers to choose price cap regulation for their BDS offerings. This would enable them to take money and effort currently wasted on regulatory compliance and devote them to better networks and services for consumers, while also strengthening incentives for operational efficiencies and innovation. In addition, we seek public input on creating a competitive market test to evaluate areas in which competition, rather than regulation, can better guide prices in ACAM carriers' territories. I look forward to seeing the record develop on this proposal. 
for the hard work on this notice. I'd like to thank Pam Arlick, Justin Falden, Lisa Hone, Chris Coves, Richard Kwiatkowski, Chris Monteith, Belinda Nixon, Eric Ralph, Ariel Roth, Douglas Slotten, Shane Taylor, and David Zessiger from the Wireline Competition Bureau, and William Dever, Billy Layton, Richard Mellon, and William Richardson from the Office of General Counsel. We'll now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenbersel. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the last item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Media Bureau will, will present the final item on your agenda today entitled Cable Channel Lineup Requirements, Section 70, 76.1705 and 76.1700A4, Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative, and Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Ms. Carey, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, the Media Bureau presents a notice of proposed rulemaking that continues our efforts to modernize our rules by eliminating outdated and unnecessary regulatory burdens. The item before you today proposes to eliminate a nearly 50-year-old requirement that cable operators maintain at their local offices a current listing of the channels that they deliver to their subscribers. Joining me at the table today are Martha Heller and Kim Matthews of the Policy Division. Kim will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we are pleased to present this notice of proposed rulemaking that would modernize the Commission's rules regarding information cable operators must provide concerning their channel lineups. The NPRM proposes to eliminate Section 761705 of our rules, which requires every cable operator to maintain at its local office a current listing of the cable television channels delivered by the system to its subscribers. This requirement was originally adopted in 1972 as part of the Commission's technical standard performance rules for cable. Although the Commission did not specifically set forth the rationale for this rule, we believe that it might have been intended to help the Commission verify compliance with technical standards that applied to certain cable channels at the time. Today, information about the channel lineups of individual cable operators is available through other sources, including, in many cases, the websites of the operator, on-screen electronic program guides, paper guides, and the Commission-hosted online public inspection file. As a result, we believe that few, if any, parties interested in channel lineup information would choose to visit an operator's local office to obtain it, and the Commission certainly does not do so. The NPRM therefore tentatively concludes that the requirement to maintain a channel lineup locally is outdated and unnecessary. The NPRM also invites comment on whether we should eliminate the requirement that cable operators make channel lineup information available through the online public file pursuant to Section 76-1700-A4. The NPRM invites comment on whether there are sufficient other sources of information apart from the online public file available to consumers regarding cable channel lineups and whether commission regulation in this area is unnecessary because cable operators have the economic incentive to ensure that customers and prospective customers are able to find out which channels they deliver. We also ask if, instead of the current online public file channel lineup requirement, we should require operators to put channel lineup information on their websites. Finally, the item invites comment on what the channel lineup requirement should be for operators of cable systems with fewer than 1,000 subscribers. These systems are exempt from all online public file requirements, including the requirement to make channel lineup information available via the online file, but they must maintain local public inspection files and are subject to the requirement that they maintain a copy of their current channel lineup locally. If the Commission eliminates the local office channel lineup requirement as proposed, the NPRM asks if we should require that small cable systems continue to retain channel lineup information locally if they do not voluntarily use the online file, or instead we should require these small operators to put channel lineup information on their own websites. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt this notice of proposed rulemaking and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matthews, for your presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. 
I have stated more than once how skeptical I am of many of the majority's current attempts to modernize media regulation by systematically rolling back rules and requirements impacting broadcasters. And while I still, while I still worry that the cumulative effects leave consumers worse off, as I have also said, so long as the public interest is served, I will support the examination of certain rules to determine whether they remain useful or necessary. Today's item proposes to remove a requirement that cable systems retain a copy of the channel lineup in their local offices. If this rule change is adopted, cable providers will be still be required to maintain channel lineup information that can be shared with subscribers at the time of installation, at least annually, and at any time upon request. I do not object to seeking comment, and if the record shows that the current requirement is redundant or unnecessary, then we should act accordingly. I am weary, however, about questions on whether cable channel lineup information should be also removed from the online public inspection files of these cable systems. Migrating public files of broadcasters and cable systems online stands out to me as a success story, demonstrating the Commission's ability to leverage the Internet and technology to improve transparency. In fact, this item justifies removing channel lineups from local offices in part by pointing out that consumers can access this information using the online public inspection files hosted on the Commission's website. Consumers should have access to more information, not less, and collecting information about entities we regulate than sharing it with the public is a core function of this agency. I would have concerns with the efforts to diminish the value of our online public inspection file database for consumers and will review the record on this point with interest. That said, I vote to approve the NPRM, which allows the Commission to seek comment on the proposals and questions that it presents. I thank the Media Bureau for their work on this item. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. I think the chair, I'm just going to sit my statement for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Uh, every Saturday morning, after I take my two boys to breakfast, we drive down to our local, local cable office and we peruse the hard <laughs> copy of the channel lineup and we plan out our take days. Take that, Ms. Matthews. Somebody does it. <laughs> for the week to see what we're going to watch for that upcoming week. Of course, it never happens. Actually, I leave my kids at home so I can really focus on the channel lineup and understand it. Um, I support this item. I think this is a requirement that we should be looking to remove, and I will not have a longer statement for the record. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, in the interest of streamlining things that are about streamlining, I will not have a statement myself. Thank you, Commissioner. You're not so lucky, folks. <laughs> Uh, in an era of widespread Internet access, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, and too many technological marvels to mention here, it is bizarre that the FCC still requires every cable operator to maintain at its local office a current listing of its cable television channels. Now, the FCC's channel lineup rules might have made sense back when they were adopted in 1972. I say might because the Commission didn't actually explain back then why it thought these regulations were necessary. As a notice surmises, perhaps the intent was to help the agency verify compliance with certain technical performance standards that no longer exist. Or perhaps it thought that Mr. Carr's predecessors, uh, the viewers of the past, might well visit a cable operator's local office to track down Meathead from All in the Family, which was one of the most watched television programs in America at the time. But as with other initiatives in our Modernization of Media Regulation initiative, this matter is now simple. Consumers can and do easily access channel lineups in ways not contemplated when the rules were adopted. Cable operators' websites, on-screen electronic program guides, paper guides, the Commission's hosted online public inspection file, and plain old Internet searches supply the information consumers want without them even having to get up off the couch. And the Commission itself has even more ways of obtaining this information. And so given these choices, 
Archie Bunker might very well deem a meathead anyone who really went to the physical office of a local cable operator to view channel lineup information. No offense, Commissioner. That, among other reasons, explains why we are proposing to eliminate this rule. So I would also like to thank the dedicated staff that worked on this notice, including Steve Brockert, Michelle Carey, Martha Heller, Kim Matthews, and Holly Sauer from the Media Bureau, and Susan Aaron and Dave Consul from the Office of General Counsel. We'll now to proceed to a vote. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner uh, O'Reilly. <coughs> aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to make any announcements at this time? Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Sorry. Lunch is coming, I promise you. Uh, and I know you're going to announce this, but I want to congratulate uh, Jean Kudo and the terrific incentive auction task for us for winning the Franz Edelman Award for Achievement in Advanced Analytics Operations Research and Management Science for its use of operations research to create a revolutionary approach to meeting the rapidly growing need for spectrum use for wireless communications in the United States and Canada. Thank you, Louis, for that short sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kudos, of course, uh, uh, to Gary Epstein, Howard Simons for their leadership, and of course for the team uh, for so many years of work. Uh, this award is a great recognition for the dedication and excellent work in designing the first ever uh, incentive um, auction. Uh, I am. I've got a longer statement for the record, believe it or not, just a few paragraphs, but I, I just want to congratulate the team. I know you will reinforce it in a minute. Absolutely. And again, forgive patience. I real uh, forgive me and have patience. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know you've heard, it's, it's been all over the news, but I wish to confirm that my chief of staff, had you going for a second, uh, <laughs> David Grossman will officially be departing or has officially departed the agency as of yesterday. I don't know if he's here or he's supposed to be here. There he is. Um, how did he get permission to sit back there? I don't know. I thought he was supposed to be in the audience. <laughs> and my staff assistant of more, of more than nine, uh, nine years, uh, Deanne Smith, um, she will be moving um, elsewhere in the agency. And I am certainly sad to uh, see them leave the office, uh, uh, but I want to welcome uh, two new legal advisors that are not so new to most of you, Neshe Gingelsberger, um, who I never say her last name, which is why, um, <laughs> as my uh, wireline advisor, and Michael Schrato, um as my media advisor. Most of you know that over the past two years, Mr. Grossman has helped me accomplish several key priorities. The sex successful uh, shepherding of the adoption of the NPRM aimed at leveling the playing field for independent programmers. The push to protect broadcast ownership rules to promote localism, competition, and viewpoint diversity, and the advocacy for the continuation of the Connect to Health Task Force and the adoption of uh, their public notice. David has been instrumental in elevating our consumer's first message and was the architect of our 13 city connecting communities listening tour in the the 20 Solutions 2020 Policy Forum back in 2016. He traveled with me. We've been from uh, hanging, out, hanging out on Skid Row uh, to Marietta, Georgia, and there we listened uh, to individuals whose voices, voices too often go unheard. He also secured key speaking opportunities for me uh, at TechCrunch, um, you know, last year and South by Southwest uh, this year. He has weathered seven. FCC oversight hearings, and to top it all off, he is directly responsible for increasing my social media following by more, by more than 350 percent. Um, <laughs> he told me to write that last line. I think you know why. It, uh, anyway, I just really want to thank him for his wise <laughs> counsel, strategic thinking, abundant energy, and his help in strengthening our office and his messaging. Uh, you truly um, exemplify what it means to uh, to be a public servant, uh, to protecting uh, consumers and promoting enhancing uh, competition, and I want to thank you. I am also coming to terms, she hates this, but walk on up, Deanne, I saw you, with the departure from the office <laughs> of Deanne Smith, in large part because she knows all of my secrets. Maybe you should step back so they don't know what you look like. <laughs> but Deanne has been instrumental in carrying out our mission as, and has provided much valuable support to me and uh, the legal advisors. I am so appreciative of you. You have been my rock. Thank you uh, very uh, much. And to you, to David and Deanne, all the best of you as you uh, continue to share your abundant talents both within and outside of the agency. 
And in, um, in a short amount of time, um, both Neshe and Michael have stepped into my office without missing a beat. And so I'm excited to uh, welcome them both. Neshe, of course, um, joins us from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, where she was the Senior Deputy Bureau Chief. She's had held several positions, as you know, Mr. Chair, uh, throughout various uh, bureaus, uh, Wireline, um, et cetera, uh, during um, her 18 years uh, at the, uh, including Wireline, during her 18 years at this agency before joining the commission. There was life with Neshe before joining the commission. She taught law at the University of Baltimore and the University of Ankara. Ankara? I always forget. I know it's Turkey. Um, and was a consultant on transnational law matters. She has an LLM from the University of Michigan, as well as law degrees from the University of Paris and the University of back home. <laughs> um, Michael, as you know, uh, joins us from his position as a legal advisor of the chief of the Enforcement Bureau. Prior to joining the commission back in 2016, Michael was a vice president of policy at the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Uh, he served um, on the uh, Commission's Consumer Advisory uh, Council and the uh, American Library Association's Public Policy Advisory Council. He has his, uh, received his law degree from Georgetown University Law Center, where he was a student at the Institute for Public Representation, a public interest law firm, and a clinical um, education program. He has a Bachelor's Art of Arts uh, from uh, New York University. So I want to welcome you both. And I want to also say I will have, um, as my colleagues have said um, a, a number of times, a formal statement uh, for the uh, a record. But I just want to uh, thank all of you. Um, I want to confirm that today will be my last public meeting at the FCC. Uh, I, I know the press corps is like, I told you so, but you know what? You've been saying that for six or eight months, so you know, we've lost all credibility. I'll, again, I'll have a more formal statement uh, for the record, but this has been the most incredible opportunity for me. In my wildest dreams, if I could have crafted my destiny I would have never dreamed of this. And I didn't write a formal statement because I didn't want to tear up. But it's hard not to be emotional at a time like this one. I've done my very best. I've met the most incredible people on the planet in this building. I have had the opportunity to message and make a difference to people who did not believe that government was here to serve. So I want to thank all of you for making that possible and more. I want to thank all of you for raising and nurturing me. And um, honestly, um, some of the lessons I could have done without, um, but most of them really, really helped me to be the person that I've become. Now, I've got a slide up here. I, I guess you can tell that I did it, so I don't know if we can widen it. It's just a bit... <laughs> You know, I, I did it very quickly, but it's a, just a snapshot of the people who have helped me the most. They know who they are. You know who you are. But I just want to say um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, I'd like to be recognized. <laughs> For sure, Riley. And I just I, remembered I forgot to tell my mom I was doing this, so I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to say thank you for your service to the American people. Uh, I know we haven't always agreed on every issue, but we've worked together on many projects. Um, I appreciate your warm counsel and your warm friendship. Uh, and wherever you do in the future, uh, you know, my door is open, and I will love to work with you on many different projects. So I appreciate your service, many years in government. Hopefully there's a, there's a future for all of us, uh, wherever that may take us. But I, I thank you so much uh, for your service, and we're going to miss you. That. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworth. Sure. Wow. You know I was going to do it in a way un unexpected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. throwing, you know, bungee jumping, all of those things that I've never done. <laughs> no, you do it all with style. Um, I just want to say goodbye to uh, a real dynamo at the FCC, um, someone who has been my partner in the public interest, 
someone I am proud to call a colleague and a friend, and I want you to know that the things you care about, the fights you fought, and the legacy you leave, I consider it a duty of all of us to make sure it stays intact. Thank you. So thank you. Appreciate it. I also did not plan on having a statement, but now uh, things have changed. And just want to thank you uh, for your public service. Thank you for your dedication to the agency. And uh, my short time as a commissioner, I've truly appreciated our ability to have one-on-one -on -one meetings, to engage, discuss items. Um, you've been a passion, passionate, determined advocate and regulator. Uh, it is something for, uh, for all of us to try to live up to that effort and that spirit. So thank you very much for your that. service. Thank you. Uh oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Are you about to say something? Oh, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I simply want to agree with everything my colleagues have said and to say uh, congratulations, Commissioner Clyburn, on your tenure. Eight years at the great, one of the greatest agencies Absolutely. in Washington. And I don't know if you foresaw what the path would hold when you came to Washington in 2009, but you blazed the path yourself. You were the first woman to chair this agency. You led with distinction. <laughs> You led with distinction, you have served with honor, and as Commissioner Riley said, even when we haven't agreed, you've always been willing to come to the table, to put your cards on that table, and to see if we could reach common ground. And I think that your, your legacy is a very rich one that will serve commissioners for years to come. Uh, and also, as I remember the first day you served in this chair as acting chairwoman back in 2013, and I remember seeing your father in that front row, oh, yeah. how proud they must be. He, he doesn't know either. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Fortunately, Congress doesn't have anything to do, know, so I'm sure really. he's uh, watching us. But, um, <laughs> but no, I, I, I just think about how proud your parents must be of the daughter they raised and the public servant they trained. You have really uh, just exemplified, I think, for them, I'm sure, what a public servant is meant to be. So uh, thank you for everything you've done. Godspeed. And if we can ever uh, be of assistance in the future, let us know. Thank uh, you leave, as I said, with a lot of friends and uh, not just a lot of coworkers. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I uh, thank all of you. I, I, I moved. And, and whatever is next, because I don't have the path all laid out, continue to consider me a, a partner, a, a public servant, and a friend of yours. Again, thank you. Thank you. Funny you should mention that I have a list of stuff that we were hoping to delegate to you uh, on a freelance basis. But oh, I've got stuff for you, too. Don't worry. <laughs> um, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't follow on Commissioner Clyburn's apt recognition of our incentive auction team. Uh, Informs is the group that uh, makes this award. It is the leading international association for operations, research, and analytics professionals. And I'm telling you, when you look at the list of finalists who are in competition for this award, you recognize how sterling our own team's work was. It was not a given that they would win. But I think the fact that they designed the world's first incentive auction conducted groundbreaking operations research and analytical work in such a profound way uh, justifies amply uh, this reward. And so I want to thank, as Commissioner Clyburn pointed out, anyone at the uh, FCC, past or present, who had anything to do with the incentive auction, the operations and analytical work that went into it. Congratulations. Uh, you have done tremendous work on behalf of this agency and the public interest. I'm simply glad that INFORMS is formally recognizing that work with an award that I think uh, will stand the test of time as, a, as an honor that you've richly deserved. Uh, with that, I think we'll turn to uh, the Secretary for the announcement of the next date of the Commission's open meeting. I just have to say thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much. <laughs> the next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, May 10th, 2018. With that, the meeting is adjourned. in just a moment, so everyone please take your seats and conversations outside. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the chairman for some opening remarks and we'll take some questions from the press. Chairman Pai. Hi, thank you, Tina. 
Um, well, folks are getting arranged, I just want to uh, reiterate what I said at the end of the meeting to recognize Commissioner Clyburn's tremendous uh, service to this agency and to the country. Over the past eight years, she has served with distinction as a commissioner as well as an acting chair of the agency. And as I, I think uh, her legacy is one of consistently striving for the public interest, uh, trying to find common ground, and uh, staying true uh, to what she believes in. And so she uh, leaves here, as I said, with not just a lot of uh, co-workers, but uh, many, many friends from both sides of the aisle. And so I will uh, miss Commissioner Clyburn and wish her all the best in the future and thank her once again for her public service. I also think it's fitting that her last meeting, uh, we had a unanimous vote on six items ranging from uh, national security of our communications networks to rural call completion to small satellites, a variety of issues, but I, we, the fact that we were able to reach common ground on all of them, I think, uh, speaks to the fact that we are, uh, generally speaking, a, a very uh, harmonious agency that works together to find consensus on a lot of these difficult issues. Uh, today's meeting might not have had the flashiest agenda. I will be the first con to concede, but I think it reflects the workmanlike approach that we have taken to promoting the public interest. In fact, I think it actually captures quite well how the agency has appropriately been both responsive and proactive with respect to important issues that fall under our jurisdiction. And I'll start with the responsive part. As communications networks have become more vital to our economy and daily lives, network security becomes more critical to national security. The FCC, therefore, has a responsibility to do what we can to protect these networks. And part of that responsibility involves the communications supply chain. Again, the process by which products and services are manufactured, sold, distributed, and installed in our communications networks. U.S. government officials have been concerned for years about the national security threats posed by certain foreign communications equipment providers in the communications supply chain. Companies use hidden backdoors in their network equipment to allow hostile foreign governments to spy on Americans, inject viruses, steal data, and more. And that is why this FCC was united in taking action today. The proposal we advanced this morning would prohibit anyone who gets universal service funding from the FCC from spending it on equipment or services from companies that raise national security concerns. The FCC is committed to protecting our national security, and our proposal to preserve the integrity of the communication supply chain is an important step toward achieving that goal. Uh, but we not only want our networks to be secure, we also want them to be the fastest and more advanced in the world. We are currently in a race for global leadership in the rollout of 5G, the next generation of wireless networks, and we are taking action to be in the lead. And so building on last month's vote to modernize our wireless infrastructure rules so that they are 5G ready, the FCC is moving full steam ahead to make spectrum available for these much faster, higher capacity networks. As you saw this morning, the commission voted unanimously to seek public input on procedures for a 28 gigahertz auction that would commence on November 14th with an auction in the 24 gigahertz band to follow immediately thereafter. Uh, by kicking off the pre-auction processes, we take another important step to promote American innovation in 5G. And with that, I will open the floor to any questions you might have. Uh, Monty Talo, Com Daily. Uh, it looks like the commission might be four commissioners for a little while. Uh, is there a, a big difference in trying to move rules through a four-person commission? Is it quicker? Is it easier? Is it harder? I don't know. We're about to find out. I wasn't here the last time the commission was uh, down to four uh, members. At You've least I believe three. I was yeah. in 2007. Uh, and so uh, I'm confident that uh, just as we were able to move uh, smoothly through our agenda today on five, six uh, rather uh, diverse issues, I'm hopeful that a commission of four people um, will find itself similarly inclined to want to find consensus and uh, practical solutions for the American people. And uh, we certainly will miss Commissioner Clyburn's input on a lot of these uh, items. Uh, she was, behind the scenes at least, uh, consistently productive in terms of coming forward with ideas, hearing out our ideas, and tr trying to see if there was uh, middle ground that could accommodate each of our interests. Uh, but I hope that the spirit of uh, Commissioner Clyburn's office, however, will persist uh, once she departs the agency. Thank you. Hey. Hi, it's Chairman Pai. This is Kelsey Griffiths, uh, Kelsey Griffiths with Law 360. Um, I was interested in the docket surrounding the national security proposal because it sounded like a lot of several, uh, a, a lot of small telecom companies were concerned that uh, 
it might veer toward a blanket ban on products from certain countries and not acknowledge that there is a global supply chain here. Um, how do you think the commission might address that going forward? Well, I certainly don't want to prejudge where this proceeding will take us. Uh, we obviously just adopted the proposal this morning, and so the entire purpose of us uh, seeking public input is to make sure that we proceed on a fully informed basis. And so I hope that all, everybody who might have a stake in these issues uh, will submit the facts in the record that will allow us to uh, proceed in a way that allow, that uh, enhances broadband deployment in rural areas, but also maintains the critical interest that we have, that the FCC have and the American public has, in maintaining the national security of our communications networks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Mr. Chairman, Brennan Bordelon with National Journal. Um, both you and your colleagues I just now uh, mentioned the need uh, for public comment to weigh in on the costs and benefits of a national security proposal. Um, I've heard from a few people in industry that are a little concerned about uh, their ability to comment on the costs and benefits in particular because they're, they're worried that a lot of this is going to be uh, classified um, and they're really not going to have much of a um, – understanding of sort of what the, the costs would be if they were to use these products so they couldn't really comment on the benefits. Could you speak to that at all and address that concern? Well, certainly we want our cost-benefit analysis on this item as in any item to be as robust as possible. Um, if there are classified aspects of the issue that um, are impeding people from being able to fully understand the issues, then that's something that we'll have to uh, try to figure out. But I'm hopeful going forward that the core uh, cost-benefit questions will be able to be answered uh, without undue uh, impotence from uh, the, that issue. Can you do one more? Is that sure? Uh, so, so the proposal's sort of coming at an interesting time uh, with U.S.-China relations. Obviously, um, a lot of talk about uh, tariffs and, and trade concerns, um, and, and I have heard from some in the industry that th there is a speculation, I guess, that this might be tied to some of the Trump administration's moves against uh, China's uh, push into American markets, uh, trade tariffs. Could you could you address that? Well, as an independent agency, of course, the FCC has a duty to make sure that it is a wise steward of federal funding through the Universal Service Fund. That's part of the reason why we unanimously adopted the proposal we did today to maintain and promote the national security of our communications networks. Overall, I think that it is fair to say that the administration has been taking a look at some of uh, the security aspects um, of our uh, communications networks and our uh, sort of economy generally. And so I think overall the uh, overriding message is that we want to preserve national security uh, through all of its dimensions. And when it comes to our bailiwick here at the FCC, uh, that dimension includes communications networks. Thanks. Hey, Margaret McGill with Politico. Um, I wanted to ask you actually about Facebook. I'm wondering if you uh, received an alert from Facebook that your personal information was shared with Cambridge Analytica, and if all the revelations have you considering maybe deleting your account, and also if you think Congress should do anything. So three questions. Go for it. Uh, no, no, up to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Busker, Communications Daily. Uh, I wanted to ask you about BDAC and sort of the latest on BDAC because there, there have been two questions that have come up. One is that are you going to are you going to be appointing any additional local government members? And secondly, do you see BDAC continuing on as sort of a FACR group after it, the reports are done? Uh, with respect to the first, we haven't made any firm determinations as to whether uh, to add any additional members and, if so, who those people might be. I will simply say that I'm very grateful to Elizabeth Bowles, uh, the chair of our uh, BDAC, and all the members who have put in a lot of time over the past several months to flesh out some of the issues that are standing in the way of broadband getting into all Americans. Um, as to the second, uh, that's one of the things we're going to have to explore. And in the lead up to the uh, next meeting of the BDAC on April uh, 25th, I think it is, or 24th, 25th, I think, um, that's one of the things we'll be uh, sitting down to discuss. Uh, but uh, the BDAC has done tremendous work so far and uh, look forward to hearing uh, what they might present to us in a few weeks. Uh, Chairman Pai, uh, you uh, co-authored an op-ed with Senator Tom Cotton, and he and other senators have expressly named Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE as a threat to U.S. national security. Based on all the re uh, reviews and briefings you've had, do you agree that those two companies pose a threat? And you, can you talk specifically about the threat that, that China might pose? And secondly, do you think any existing equipment in the networks will need to be removed as a result of this order? or uh, further action from Congress? 
With respect to the first component of the question, I can't comment on any particular company uh, or country. What I'll simply say is that the proposal, as you have seen in the uh, released text uh, from a few weeks ago, which is basically in this particular case uh, essentially identical to what was released, um, we simply tee up some of the concerns that other entities within the U.S. government, both in Congress and otherwise, have identified. And so we seek public comment on how we should determine what that universe of companies or uh, countries is uh, moving forward. I think we simply wanted to vindicate the basic principle that if there is the determination by some uh, entity within the U.S. government that uh, a particular uh, company poses a threat to national security, uh, we do want to make sure that universal funding does not extend ultimately to the procurement of products and services from that company. And so we haven't made any determination as to a specific company at this point on our own. Uh, the second part of your question, gosh, In terms I'm, of sorry. equipment in the network, does anything need to be removed, uh, you yes. think, or do you envision that that would be something that the rule would consider? That's one of the issues that uh, Commissioner Carr raised, and we are seeking uh, public input on that particular question. And so uh, any uh, f you know, further uh, analysis of that, I would refer you to Commissioner Carr's office. Hi, I'm Hello. Toby. Hello. I'm Toby from Policy Tracker. Um, my question's about competition for millimeter wave holdings. I'm wondering if you could outline your um, approach to this. Um, the background being that, according to what T Mobile is saying, 98% of the um, urban 28 gigahertz band licenses are already assigned. Um, and there was talk about the FCC taking back those licenses. Um, the AT&T had an idea about compensating the current owners of it. Uh, Clyburn also mentioned um, uh, reviewing the CAPS um, approach, bearing in mind the straight path um, transfer that was approved earlier. So I wonder if you could outline your approach to competition and what is the good outcome of all of the millimeter wave spectrum auctions that are coming in the pipeline? Uh, to go back to very first principles, uh, given tremendous interest in these millimeter wave bands, we take the approach that a free market would be the best way to allocate uh, these spectrum licenses, uh, adopting the same principles that Ronald Coast outlined in 1959 and that were vindicated by Congress in 1993 by giving us competitive bidding. We believe that ultimately the allocation of these licenses uh, through an auction would be the best way to determine who would be able to, number one, who would be interested in these bands, but also number two, uh, who would put these bands to the highest valued use. And I think one of the great innovations of the FCC has been not to make that determination on our own, but to allow flexible use through market allocation to let companies experiment and see what thrives. And I'm hopeful, given the tremendous interest we've seen in the 28 and 24 gigahertz bands, I'll see a tremendous amount of uh, bidding and ultimately competition when it comes to 5G. Hi, Steve, you good? Right. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. At this point, we'll transition to the Bureau press conference with my colleague, Mark. Okay, are there any questions on the um, national security item? No? Yeah, yeah. I yes, okay, Hi. Brendan, all right, sorry. Uh, Waterline, come on up. I was on my phone. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks. So, so just just to clarify, um, there's been no determination in terms of what kind of equipment would potentially run afoul of this rule yet. So theoretically, it could be wireless, wireline, handsets. That that's all to be determined uh, as a result of this NPRM. Yes. Great question. Um, this is a notice of proposed rulemaking. Yeah. So we're asking questions about what types of equipment and services should be covered by the proposed rule. Okay. And. and um, uh, let's get one more thing. Uh, and, and then when it comes to the perspective or, or going forward nature of the NPRM, I'm a little confused because uh, Commissioner Carr said something about potentially having to remove equipment um, if this passes. Again, I know it's sort of in flux, but that, that would sort of by definition be not going forward, right? They would have to come back and, and rip out equipment. So, so that is still potentially on the table for this proposal. The item itself proposes that the rule be prospective. But as the chairman said, Commissioner Carr raised a question about that. So we do include questions in the item about precisely how this should this should roll out okay. and play out. And, and would perspective include, so let's say you have, let's say Huawei comes under the ban, um, and you have uh, equipment that um, 
you've already installed. And so you're, you don't have to rip it out because it's going forward, but you need to uh, have a software upgrade. Can you upgrade the software? I mean, is, my, maybe you don't have this answer yet, but is that sort of one of the concerns or one of the issues that you guys are going to be grappling with? Again, great question, and it's teed up in the NPRM. Okay. We ask those precise types of questions. But and we're looking for, as the chairman said, a robust record that will help us uh, make those kinds of determinations as to what the impi- impact might be going forward. So, so going forward is still sort of a definition in flux as yes. well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have sort of the same type of questions, but but <laughs> limited to handsets. I mean, I actually took the trouble to read the item. I don't think I saw the word handsets in there. Uh, uh, so, what, 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 how does the item propose to treat handsets? And I'm asking because consumers can walk into a lot of stores now and buy a Huawei gadget. Uh, will they still be able to do that? I mean, and let, let's say you choose to use a Huawei gadget and you get Lifeline. How, how does that play into it, et cetera? That's Again, it. this is a notice of proposed mm-hmm. rulemaking, so we're seeking we're seeking comment and want a robust record about the types of equipment and services that should be covered by the rule. And my my uh, staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't ask questions along the lines of what you're what you're what you're asking here. But people would be free to file and make of course. suggestions. You'd expect yep. that, I would imagine. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, all kinds of issues are on the table. Um, we have many questions. You read the item. In the item okay. itself, we're seeking a robust record. Stakeholders that are affected should, by all means, uh, participate, participate in the rulemaking proceeding. Okay, thank you. And, and I do actually have one more. Sorry. Uh, so so uh, there seems to be a little bit of confusion. Maybe it's just confusion on my end. Um, when it comes to denying subsidies, uh, USF assistance, is that specifically for the purchase of the products that are going to be banned, or is it sort of, so my my question is, if a company has anything from Huawei or ZTE, assuming that these companies come under some kind of ban, uh, are they immediately denied USF assistance across the board, or is it just for the purchase of that equipment? Do you understand? No, I'm not sure. So, so, like, let's say you purchase... If you purchase 100 million in in Huawei equipment, right? Do you lose 100 million in USF assistance, or do you lose USF assistance entirely? Do you guys? I, so I think that the answer to your question is that the proposal in the item is um, to prohibit the use of universal service fund support for equipment or services provided by covered companies. But the item, as Chris has said, asks a number of questions about how that should be implemented um, and what that should look like. So, of course, people who have concerns along the lines you describe should come in and file in the in the record so that the commission can consider that. And the, and the item itself also asks questions, and one of the reasons I'm hedging a little bit here, about how we should enforce this rule. Okay. Um, so those those issues are on the table to be considered in an order should the commission choose to go that route as to how it implements and enforces the rule. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. I have I've, uh, just a, two questions. Howard Busker, Communications Daily. Or, uh, really one basic question, and it, they bo- it relates to um, stuff that Commissioner Carr said. And it seemed he said that that, that, that – um, that, the order, the NPRM now asks questions beyond just uh, about. I think about remedies beyond just cutting off U.S. Support, uh, USF support. So am I correct then that it was expanded in other areas to look at other remedies other than just on the USF? As I said, the item asks questions about how we should enforce the rules. So, um, in terms of support, in terms of Section okay, 503 okay, okay, types of penalties, right. those questions are on the table. And I see Commissioner Carr. Um, so. Um, I'm sure he would be pleased to answer your question as well. Okay, and then also he also mentioned the, co- the, the, the cost-benefit analysis, I believe. And did you – are you doing a more thorough cost-benefit analysis than was originally proposed in the draft? Uh, the draft should be out shortly, um, so I encourage you to take a look at the cost-benefit You mean cost the NPRM analysis. will be out because the yeah. draft's out, right? So. Yeah. Just briefly to follow up uh, on that, uh, the Commissioner Carlos talked about uh, testing regimes. What, what does that entail in terms of how? Again, I'll defer to Commissioner uh, Carr, but we do ask questions oh, about right. testing regimes. He's right there. <laughs> He's walking away right. now. <laughs> now. Now he has to stay, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as long as the wireline bureau is here, are there questions on the um, rural call completion issue? 
And how about on the BDS issue? If not, I think the okay. dismissed. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. Um, next would be the wireless, the uh, 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 next generation wireless item. Any questions on the next generation wireless item? We have two. So wireless, come on up. I have a very simple question, so I'll go first. Uh, it's just to clarify that there's nothing in the current item uh, that means that they can't establish um, other millimeter wave auctions going forward. So, so what Rosenwurst was talking about having a, uh, a calendar for other millimeter wave um, auctions. Uh, there's nothing about this 24 and 28 gigahertz um, uh, 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 document, co co consultation that's going to prevent those other um, procedures from going forwards. It, it's just to clarify, really, because, I mean, I suppose it's not, but I just wanted to make sure it wouldn't. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think if you're asking, is there anything in the um, comment PN that we're issuing now on the 24 gigahertz and 28 gigahertz auctions that touches on timing of other auctions um, one way or the other. I think exactly. the answer is, is no. This particular comment PN focuses specifically on the 28 gigahertz auction that it's announcing will start in November and the 24 gigahertz auction that will follow thereafter. But um, the commission obviously is working on a number of other spectrum bands as well. Okay. And then um, CTIA raised the issue of the anti-collusion rules and whether they would apply across both auctions. And I mean, that was kind of touched on something that was a big issue a while back with the prolong, you know, when some of these auctions last a long time. Does the PN ask questions about that and, and sort of what's what, what's the best thing to do in, in terms of anti-collusion? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, the, the PN uh, uh, seeks comment on how to address um, uh, the application of those Part 1 rules, whether it's uh, uh, prohibition on, on uh, certain communications or joint bidding rules um, across the two auctions and, and um, uh, whether they should apply across across both or or just one and sort of, um, as some of the commissioners have mentioned, sort of tease up a number of the trade-offs with respect to how you, uh, uh, how you set that up. Thank you. Anything else on this item? Okay, thanks. Um, International Bureau, uh, the um, small satellites, any questions on the small satellites? Just there's one, so Tom and company. <clears throat> Hi, Kelsey Griffiths with Law360. Maybe I misunderstood the item, but I'm wondering whether it addresses at all um, unauthorized small satellite launches like Swarm um, recently got deemed for. Does this relate in any way? Um, it's not related. Swarm was uh, applying under Part 5, an experimental license. Our NPRM deals with Part 25, the commercial uh, licensing. So that's the distinction. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I was wondering, um, again, a naive question. How does this impact the ITR processes in terms of coordination with other administrations uh, to avoid interference? And um, also, if the definition of small satellites that was read out earlier, if that's um, in line with the definition that I think they're working on as part of an agenda item for WRC19, I, I forget which one, but about um, uh, what to do about small satellites, more or less. Those are great questions. We do tee up in the NPRM. We ask questions. Uh, noting that we are trying to come up with the definition under our rules, how we would treat them. The broader I the definition of small satellites is a little bit distinct from what we're trying to do here in creating under Part 25 rules how we would define this new category of commercial small satellites. Um, but we're happy to talk to you a little bit more about that in terms of the ITU or other aspects of how it relates. 
Okay. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit naive in how the process works here, but do you have to get um, the FCC authorization as Part 25, and then the FCC then coordinates with the administrations to avoid interference to their consolations, or is that not really how it works? And would this, if, if it is how it works, would this, what you're proposing, change any of that? So I believe this, and correct me if I'm wrong, this doesn't change our coordination requirements. This just facilitates and innovates the process under which under the FCC will license commercial small satellites. The FCC also licenses small satellites under Part 97, amateur services, as well as Part 5, experimental. And um, do you want, anyone want to comment on the ITU coordination process? Okay. Yeah, all, all the satellites will, uh, let's say, uh, as the, the authorization is issued, there will be a, an ITU filing, and they will have the obligations that uh, any ITU filing of any of these categories that Tom mentioned uh, have to comply. And uh, the, so the, the operator will coordinate uh, with other operators, and eventually the FCC will get involved as well as necessary. And this is Jose Albuquerque, Chief of the Satellite Division. Okay. Anything else? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the last item is the cable lineup uh, requirements. Any questions on that, on that item? And if not, I think we have, uh, I see Commissioner O'Reilly and Carr are here, if not others. So, Commissioners, take care. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Well, I'll ask the first question. Um, since um, se several of the things were referred back to Commissioner Carr, and um, I just wanted to ask Wait, you for a little more. Happy to answer those. A little more, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little more color on on stuff. You were talking about some of the changes that were made, uh, to the, yeah. and that seemed important. So. Can you give us a little more color on that? Yeah, absolutely. I can sum up real quick for you. So there's one rule that the item proposes. That's the rule that you all saw in the publicized version, which relates to questions about how do we identify uh, equipment by companies that pose a national security risk. And then uh, the proposed rule is about USF funding related to that. Uh, I asked for three, uh, in general, three edits on the item. One was just to make more explicit what is already implicit in the item about information gathering and let's get as much information as possible to make the best possible decision. Uh, the second and third pieces, the second piece is I asked for uh, to expand with a couple sentences uh, that ask about equipment other than just equipment that's USF funded. And so we'll see what the record discloses on that. The third thing that I asked for was let's put even more remedies uh, on the table uh, so that can range anywhere from the proposed rule itself uh, on USF funding to potentially other measures that I'm interested in people commenting to us on, whether it's some sort of testing or screening regime that we could employ uh, either before or as part of this equipment being deployed to the extent we make that threshold determination, or whether we should take actions directed at either the removal or the prospective deployment. Again, no particular end goal in mind on my part, simply it's a matter of making sure we look at this holistically and that if we decide that there is equipment that poses a national security threat, that we then now have an even more full range of options for choosing the right approach, the right calibrated approach. And that was essentially what I was talking about. But again, stepping back, you know, we are taking these actions in the context of a lot of agencies uh, in the U.S. government that are looking at some of these issues, so we're a complement to those efforts. And then, and then f uh, one final thing on that. Uh, uh, some of the small carriers have, have raised questions or concerns about, um, because a lot of them are buying equipment, from what I understand, from the Chinese suppliers, like they feel like they can get a good deal. They've been, those, those, some of the, they've been very active. These, these suppliers have been very active in that rural market. I think Huawei has somebody on um, our the Rural Wireless Association's board. Is that concerning? I mean, I'm just, I know because both of you care a lot about rural broadband development. So how, is that concerning that, you know, that, that just given the, the backdrop? 
Well, the record, uh, as it developed in the three weeks since the document was public, was very light. There were uh, very few, I think just a handful of filings. So this view wasn't uh, fleshed out uh, in actual filings in the record. I was aware of sort of trade press commentary on the issue. But I encourage everyone to, to put their views on the record. You know, we'll put it all in there and we'll, you know, weigh all of these interests as best we can and reach the best result that tries to balance you know, the degree of the national security threat that we perceive, the economic impact, whether it's a good one or a bad one, what that's going to be. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll then uh, reach a decision when the chairman calls the item forward. Commissioner O'Reilly? Well, I think, I think Commissioner Carr said it well. We're opening up the item, and I've heard the arguments presented. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll be expressed in the, in, in the, the item. We also, you know, have the, the item proposes a waiver process. We'll have to see what that means and how it would function and what is the scope of that. So I think there's broad enough uh, examination of the entire issue, and we'll just see where it goes uh, once, uh, once the comments are submitted. Thank you. Do either one of you at this point have um, any firmer thoughts about Huawei or ZTE or whether you think China expressly poses a threat to the U.S. as some members of Congress have suggested? I don't want to comment about any particular company or particular nation. You can see my comments broadly that I think there are a number of uh, foreign nations that have uh, did not have the United States' best interest at heart, and they go through mu multiple uh, approaches uh, to, uh, to get to their end goal. Um, and so I, I'm critical of that, but I don't want to get to any particular company or any particular country right now. Um, how, can I just ask the yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Can you just respond yeah. to that too? And then uh, there. Yeah, just similarly, I'm, I'm interested to see how the record developed. It's important that we started this process. Uh, we'll continue to, to see the record. We'll continue to get briefings. Uh, and I have an open mind about how we ultimately resolve this. Unrelated to national security, I'm wondering if either of you can tell us any more details about Commissioner Clyburn's replacement. <laughs> I, um, I, I honestly don't know the process or the timing of what may be in it works. I, I look forward to learning that, uh, and so I don't have any com I, I've seen names in the press, but I don't have any more information than you do uh, on that, so nothing more I can add. Yes, yeah, so I, I have no uh, insight on that issue. No problem, thanks. Uh, when it comes to determining, back to national security, when it comes to determining which companies uh, are theoretically um, a threat, how is the FCC going to go about this? Uh, that you guys don't have like an intelligence apparatus. I mean, I imagine you guys will have to be in touch with the intelligence community at some level. Um, but, but I mean, what, who are you guys going to be talking to to make these determinations? Well, I think one that we'll be talking to is something I referenced is the team telecom process okay. and looking for reform to that structure uh, in terms of how they, they, the executive branch provides input into our items. It already exists today. It's rather informal. I'd like to see that structure change so we have a, a much more uh, process that's more um, well-known um, and also has some limits to the timing of so as we actually get submissions uh, within a reasonable uh, so we can make some decisions uh, within a reasonable amount of time so we, have, we can make some decisions decisions here. So I think the team telecom is one uh, apparatus, uh, and, and beyond that, we'll just, uh, I'll just, we'll see how the, the comments uh, come from the ex executive branch or anyone else. I have a question, if I'm not jumping in front of anybody. Okay. Um, Margaret McGill with Politico. I wanted to follow up on some comments that Commissioner Rosenworcel made on the high, high band spectrum auction. Uh, she talked about the need for publishing a, a calendar of auctions. I'm curious, uh, do you agree? Do you think that's something that the Commission should be doing? Well, I don't want to get ahead of the Chairman on this, He's, but um, I think you may look back. There was a time period when Commissioner Rosenworcel wasn't exactly here, uh, and I, I articulated there was some need for a calendar. So I've been supportive of such a thing, uh, but I don't want to get, you know, I want to see what the Chairman's intending here. He's obviously put two bands forward. I've called for two additional bands in my statement today, and I called for uh, identifying additional bands uh, that, that we're intending to have a Spectrum Frontiers uh, item later this this summer uh, to ad identify additional bands. I want to put as much spectrum out in the marketplace as possible in the high bands and then working really hard on the mid bands as well. So I agree with the calendar, but I think we're also working with everything else and I want to you know, get with the chairman and see what his thoughts are. Commissioner Carr, could you? Yeah, I think we're all rolling in the same direction on this. It's a tremendous lot of, amount of work uh, sort of behind the scenes to get these auctions up and running and we've been pushing ahead on these issues um, you know, in parallel to Congress fixing our auction authority and the work uh, continues, whether it's an additional Spectrum Frontiers item. Uh, we are pushing ahead 
uh, to push as much spectrum out there as we can and get to auctions as quickly as we can. I think we're all uh, in agreement, everyone on the commission, uh, staff as well, uh, that we're working hard towards that goal. So uh, following up on that question, um, previously, Riley, you spoke about the 26 gigahertz band. I guess that's one of the bands you're going to mention in your statement. Say it again. You talked about the 26 gigahertz band uh, before, um, which would put the U.S. in line with the rest of the world in terms of their thinking for, for millimeter wave bands. Um, where are we with that? Do you reckon it's going to? Do you reckon you're building enough support to make that available? So I think that's a, a process that we're going to have to consider later this summer, and we're trying to, you know, expedite that as soon as possible. Um, there, we have to put as many bands in the, and there's a number of bands that I mentioned, 32, 50. There's a number of bands that I mentioned in my statement. I think 26 is part of that discussion, and they all have to be considered to see what the limitations are of whether the domestic or international, and, and move forward as, as soon as possible. I think there are some questions that I'll talk about. It, you know, I mentioned some comments yesterday regarding our capabilities of auctioning all of these bands at once, and given the things that. We're also considering what our capabilities at auction, but I want to put as much spectrum out there as possible. I think 26 has to be part of that conversation. Yes, certainly. I mean, this has been uh, an effort that, that a lot of us, uh, in fact, as a staffer, going back to 2015, 2016, we've been continuing to push to get as much spectrum moving into the pipeline. That's, that's work that we're continuing to do today. Anything else? Well, I mean, I, I guess to follow up, um, I, I, I can't recall who mentioned it, but somebody mentioned the need for mid-band spectrum as well for 5G. Where do you think we're going with 6 gigahertz? Do you reckon we're going to have some sort of, um, have your views evolved from the NOI and the RKF study and, and all of this? Well, I think you've seen my comments regarding 3.7 to 4.2 and 6 gigahertz and what I think can, can be done in that space. Um, hopefully we'll have an NPRM later this summer is my, uh, my my request, and I think that has to be something we, we, we shoot for. I think it should be done. I think both items, uh, both bands can be done at the same time. Um, but that's that's one portion of it. I think I'm, we're, we're working really hard. My team and I are working really hard on the CBRS band at 355 to 37, uh, and then also working uh, in a little bit lower than that in 31 to 355, and trying to make as much spectrum in the mid bands as w available at the same time um, and as quickly as possible. So I'm hopeful that we can resolve those things. You know, the the, the intent on the on 37 to 42 and 6 gigahertz would be certainly my intent to have a, something an item this summer. Uh, and then and three and CBRS, you know, we're in, in momentarily trying to work through a bunch of issues that I've already talked about at length. I think. I wanted to ask a question. I, I haven't really been focused on stingrays so much, but that was an issue that was raised by Commissioner Rosenworcel. The, the, some of the reports, I guess, are that foreign governments are using them to. And, and is that something that would be concerning to either of you? I mean. What, 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 what sort of where are you coming down on that? I, I just received the letter this week from the from the members of Congress, so I have to look at it closely. I wasn't aware of uh, the arguments they presented, and Commissioner uh, Rosenworcel talked about it at length, so I have to look into them to understand more. But you know, certainly it would be of concern if it's you know if it was an attempt by foreign governments. We also in the past have looked, um, and, and, and there has been law enforcement issues of, regarding the, the Stingray uh, technology. So, uh, for lack of a better word, I, I, there's lots of you know phrases people use for that purpose, but that general technology. Um, and so I, I, I want to know more about it before I formulated a position. Any other questions before we head to lunch? Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.